All right. So yesterday we spoke about the the origins of metabolism and also a little bit about the history of the study of metabolism. And today I want to talk about some of the underlying principles, physical principles, that make metabolism run. Okay? You can hear that I'm losing my voice a little bit. So if you can't hear at the back, just move to the front, okay, so you can hear me. Um, so today we will talk about some of the uh, laws of nature which tell us uh, which reactions, which steps in metabolism uh, will spontaneously happen, which will not happen, um, and maybe how we can help them to occur even though they should normally not. Anyway, the, the name of the, of the lecture is What Fuels Our Cells. We will be mostly talking about a part of physics and chemistry called thermodynamics. So this is what we'll cover in this lecture, at least some very basic principles of that. But before we get to the actual thermodynamics, uh, let's have a short brainstorm about this, the title of the lecture, which is what fuels our cells. So if somebody asked you what fuels our cells, what would you tell them? ATP. Energy. Our fuels glucose. Glucose? Okay. Glucose. Carbohydrates. Okay, so that's the umbrella term. Yeah, sure. Fats. Okay. Okay, so carbohydrates, carbohydrates, fats are parts of a what, what group? How would we call, call them? The nutrients, one. yeah, nutrients. Um, energy stored in bonds, yeah, maybe. So we have energy there, okay, so chemical bonds. Hmm. Macromolecules, okay, why not? Okay, the question still is what fuels our cells, okay, rather than what these things have in common, okay? But macromolecules, yeah, why not? Molecules. What fuels our cells? And you can think as abstractly or as concretely or as, you know, out of the box as you want. Chemical reactions, sure. Food, okay, uh, we have nutrients here, so those are the components of food, but yeah, absolutely, food does fuel our cells. We have energy there already, yeah, yeah, okay, but energy, sure. Sleep? Yeah, okay. <laughs> we definitely need to sleep, okay? So, you're right. Without sleep, our cells would probably not be fueled properly. <laughs> Oxygen, sure. Oxygen. Caffeine. Okay. Okay, caffeine. Definitely. Water, enzyme. Water, sure. We definitely need water. Without it, things wouldn't run. Uh, enzymes and coenzymes. Enzymes. Yeah, absolutely. They're essential for Signals. running metabolism. Signals, some information, absolutely. All right. So this was just a little warm-up brainstorm about how we can look at this concept of what fuels, what, ma what makes our cells run. And most of these things, or all of these things, are definitely relevant and are essential oftentimes for uh, what happens there. I will, for the, for the first half of the lecture, I will take one of these terms, which is 
probably the most abstract out of all of these. Most of the other ones are pretty concrete things. Uh, but energy is a relatively abstract thing uh, in physics or in science. And we'll start with that and build up on this concept of energy. So what is energy? Heat is energy. Uh, OK, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. OK, uh, so yeah, heat is related. OK, so the textbook definition of energy is the potential of a system to do work, okay? So it is a potential to do work. Now, let's unpack that a little bit in order to really make sure that everybody understands what we're talking about. So first of all, um, we need to talk about what a system is, okay? So it's the ability, it's the potential of a system to do work. So what is a system? Well, in thermodynamics, in science generally, physics, hmm? go ahead. Yeah, there are different kinds of systems, but what is a system? Well, a system really is just the part of the universe that we are, do you have a question? Okay, but if you do, ask, okay? Okay, excellent. Uh, so a system is just part of the universe that we are interested in, that we're studying, okay? So we have a system, for example, a test tube or a cell or whatever, um, the sun or the solar system or whatever, whatever we're interested in. And the rest is the surrounding, the surrounding area, the surroundings of our system, okay? This distinction between the system that we're measuring and studying and the surroundings will become important later on, okay? So a system can be anything that we're interested in, the rest are surroundings. Now, energy is a potential ability, okay, so it doesn't, have to happen, again, will become important later on, okay? But it gives, it measures the, the potential, the ability of a system to do work. Now, what is work? Okay, so mechanical work, okay, is related to force and, and displacement, etc. Okay, so it's one type of work. Is? It is one what turns on the energy? Yeah, the part that's actually activated. Then, you know. um, not, not, not quite, okay. Um, so one type of work is this mechanical work, as you all know from physics, okay, moving things around by exerting force on them. But there are other kinds of work as well. It could be chemical work, okay, it could be expansion work, okay. Yes, work is a type, one of two types, of transfer of energy. So work in general, all these different types of work that we talked about, is just a one type of how we can transfer energy from one part of a system to another, or from one system to another, or from one, one system to the surroundings, okay? Uh, Work is a transfer of energy which is ordered, which is directed, okay? So for example, if we talk about mechanical work, we can say that if I move this piece of paper from this place to that place, I exerted some force on it, okay? And all the particles in the paper moved in the same direction. So it was an ordered transfer of energy, okay? I transferred energy to the piece of paper, okay? Moved it, and it was pretty ordered because everything moved in the same direction. But we also have, well, it kind of makes sense, we also have a disordered or unordered transfer of energy from one system to another or to the surroundings or whatever. And we call this transfer of energy heat. So going back to the suggestion that heat is a type of energy, not really. Heat is a type of transfer of energy, okay? So energy is a unifying concept, okay? Energy is a potential to do work, as we just said. And if we transfer energy from one place to another, from one system to another, we have two possibilities. Either we can transfer it in a directed way, and then we call this transfer work, 
or we just transfer it in a disordered way. Okay, if I started heating up this paper, the particles in the paper would just start randomly moving faster than they were moving before, but there would be no one direction, okay, one way of transferring the energy in an ordered way. So heat and work are both just different kinds of transferring energy, of transfers of energy. Now, what I just said here uh, can be in a way formulated or can be put together in a mathematical relationship in the following way. So the usual uh, letter that we use to denote energy of a system is U, okay? Uh, e is sometimes used in different contexts, okay? But the total sum of energy of any system is denoted as U, which stands for total internal energy, okay? Now, why do we have U and not E, for example? Well, because the, the energy in a system is stored in many different forms of energy, okay? It could be kinetic energy, it could be potential energy, it could be rotational energy, it could be energy of chemical bonds, uh, it could be energy, potential energy in a gravitational field or whatever, okay? So these would be different kinds of energy, and if we sum all of them together in a system, we, take the, we, ha we get this total internal energy, which is denoted as U, okay? Just a letter, and it's just the sum of all the energies in a system. Now, we know from experience, uh, and it is an experience that has been tested many, many times, is that in order to increase the internal energy of a system, we have to add some energy to it. And if we want to decrease the energy of a system, we have to take some energy away. What I just said is a law of nature called the conservation of energy or the first law of thermodynamics. So the first law of thermodynamics says, basically, that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transferred from one place to another. So if we have a system of a certain internal energy, if we want to increase this energy, we have to add some energy to it. And we just said that there are only two ways of adding energy. What are they? That there are just two ways of adding, of transferring energy to something, and those are heat or work. So we can formulate the first law of thermodynamics by saying that a change in internal energy of a system is equal to the heat, denoted as Q, which we give to the system, plus the work which we give to the system, which we perform on the system. So the first law of thermodynamics is really saying the internal energy of a system will remain constant, will not change, unless we add or remove some energy by a disordered method, by moving heat around, or by an ordered method, by performing work or by having the system perform work on its surroundings. Okay, so this relatively simple, this fairly simple mathematical expression is just a formulation of the first law of thermodynamics. Energy is conserved. We can't make energy, we can't destroy energy, we can only move it around. Okay? Good. So this is the first law, uh, the law of conservation of energy. Now, from this, from this concept of energy, by the way, the concept of energy is actually relatively recent. So compared to most quantities in physics, energy is one of the latest one to be codified. And the reason is that for, for a long time in scientific history, people didn't know or they didn't realize or they didn't have this concept or whatever, um, that the different kinds of energy, kinetic energy, potential energy, electrical energy, chemical energy, etc., are just different kinds of energy. So they assumed that they were different things. And we will see in the second half of the lecture one of these ideas, one of these currently not valid ideas about different kinds of energy. And it came actually quite late in the second half of the 19th century that people were like, no, wait, actually, 
it's all energy, only performing in different ways. So it came very much, much, much later than most other uh, most other physical quantities and uh, and concepts. So out of this idea of an internal energy, and we'll be using this for some calculations, some expressions later on. Uh, physical chemists derived, kind of did a mathematical trick, derived a related quantity, which is in many ways more useful for chemical research. And we'll define it, I'll show you what it means, and you've probably heard of it before, uh, because we will then use it in the second half of the lecture to derive something else. And this new quantity that is derived from internal energy is called enthalpy. Enthalpy and it's denoted as H. Now, most of you, many of you, some of you have heard about enthalpy. So, what is enthalpy? The measurement of internal energy? Um, it is sort of a method to sort of measure internal energy, but it's not quite. It's actually derived from the internal energy, but. Um, it's change in heat. Delta H. I, I understand, yeah. Uh, so delta H under some conditions is equal to Q. So change in the enthalpy of a system is equal to the heat that was received by the system. That is true, okay? But change in heat doesn't make a lot of sense if you think about it if heat is just a transfer of energy, right? So we can't say there is this much heat in the system because heat is just a, a method of moving energy around, okay? So change in heat is really doesn't fit into what, huh? What depends on the type of system? Okay, um, I don't want to go on a, on a tangent too much, okay? But there is no such thing as heat energy. There's energy, which is conserved, okay? And then there are move, different ways of moving around. And we can definitely move, you know, add heat to a system and then take away work from it, okay? Heat doesn't have to be conserved, it's not. It was previously thought that it is conserved, and we'll talk about it in the second half of the lecture, but now we know that those are just different kinds of transfer of energy, okay? So, you said correctly there's something to do with heat and with adding heat to the system. So, I will show you what enthalpy really is, and it is a bit of a, yeah, it, it, it will look a bit strange, okay? Enthalpy is defined as a sum of the internal energy of a system plus, the product of its pressure and volume. Yeah? Enthalpy is defined as the sum of the internal energy of the system plus the product of its pressure and its volume. So imagine that we have, in so internal energy, we know what internal energy is, okay? We, it's the sum of all the energies. So imagine that if we knew the sum of all the energy in this, in this water bottle, if we wanted to calculate the enthalpy, we would take this sum of energies and we would just measure the volume, okay, whatever it is, I don't know, water of a liter or something like that, okay, and multiply it by the pressure that's inside it. Now, it's a sum of the internal energy plus the product of pressure and volume of the system. So that's the internal environment? No, it's enthalpy which is defined in this way. Don't worry, I'll show you in a second wh why that is, because it's obvious that you're just thinking, why would anyone do that? What, what does it mean? Okay, you're just adding energy plus some product of pressure and volume. What does it mean? Okay, that's strange, okay? And it is strange because enthalpy is not a real physical quantity. I mean, it is, mathematically speaking, but you can't really explain what it is. Like, 
okay? So it's not really the amount of heat in some way, okay? It's just a, a sum of internal energy plus P times V. And you are asking yourselves, or me, or whatever, in your heads, why, why did they come up with this strange quantity? Well, the reason why they came up with this strange quantity is that it is much easier, or changes of enthalpy is, are much easier to measure than changes in internal energy. It's very difficult to measure what is going on with internal energy, but it's much easier to measure changes in enthalpy because, under certain conditions, change in enthalpy of a system is equal to the heat that was received by the system, which is quite easy to measure because we can basically just measure the temperature, okay? How does it work? Why, how can we, how is it possible that we can just like change this U into H and measure it in a completely different way? I can't really spend too much time with it, okay? So I will just kind of show you the direction of thinking, and if you're interested, you can look it up, how this works. Basically, enthalpy, or the change of enthalpy, is only equal to the heat transferred to the system under very specific conditions. And these conditions are that the system is not doing any work on its surroundings except for volume work or expansion work. There are different kinds of work, okay? It could, for example, be sending electrical current or somewhere or making some chemical bonds or something like that, okay? Different kinds of work. And one type of work is what is called expansion work. Basically, imagine that you have a chemical reaction which is producing some gas, and this gas needs to expand against the atmosphere that has some pressure, okay? And this is work, okay? It is expansion work because the, the pressure, you're pushing against the pressure, and it's basically mechanical work. Okay? You're moving things. Yeah? It's a mechanical work, expansion work. And this expansion work can be calculated by multiplying the change of volume. Okay? We start with such volume, and then we end up with this volume. So the change in volume times the pressure against which we have to push. So in a system which is only doing this expansion work, no other work is done. Okay? And, and I will explain in a second why, why we have this strange conditions, okay? There is a reason for it. But in a system that is only doing expansion work, basically, this term that we added to the internal energy cancels this term, which is in the definition of internal energy, because this is a type of work. It's an expansion work. So if the system is only doing work, by adding this term P times V, we get rid completely of this work, and then the change in this, obviously it's enthalpy, is only gonna be equal to Q because the, the work goes away. We don't have to measure it, we don't have to take care of it. It just happens, but we kind of, by a mathematical trick, we kind of erase it. We, we don't need to look at this work at all. We're just gonna be measuring heat, and that tells us what, what happens to enthalpy in the system. I know that this, it, it is a bit of a trick, but it's a trick that's very useful because most chemical reactions in our cells and also in our labs do exactly this, okay? The only work that is going on is this expansion work against the atmosphere or something, and there's no other work going on, okay? So by looking just at the heat going out or going into the system, we can find out, we can measure what is happening to the internal states of the system. So it's a trick, but a trick which for many I was gonna say real life situations, but not really, more like research situations, is a good trick, okay? So this is the definition of, of enthalpy. It's, it's a bizarre thing, but it's a very useful thing for chemists. And the reason why I'm spending so much time with it is that we will use it then to define something else, okay? So, so this is a preparation for, uh, uh, for a definition of something other. I mean, most of you probably have heard about enthalpy. Just raise your hand if, you've heard, if you had heard about, about it. Yeah, okay. Uh, but probably not such a deep description of what it is, okay? So it is related to heat because heat changes it, but really it's just a mathematical trick how to forget how, so that we don't have to measure this work. We kind of get rid of it and we just measure heat, which is much easier, okay? Because in a test tube, if you are evolving a gas, it would be very difficult to measure the expansion work. You would have to measure how much gas is produced and what the pressure is. 
this way you just kind of, kind of get rid of it and you don't have to care about it. Okay, so it's a bit of a trick. All right. Now, we have defined, or not we, but we know that energy is defined as a potential to do work, but this potential does not necessarily get realized. So we can have a system that contains a lot of energy and we want it to do some work, but in many situations, this will not happen, okay? For example, um, the, the world's oceans contain massive amounts of energy, okay? Incredible amounts of energy, of heat energy, we would call so movements of, the, uh, of the, the molecules, okay? However, the temperature of the ocean is whatever, four degrees or five degrees on average or something. It's very cold, okay? So there's a massive amount of energy, but we can't really extract the energy because it's pretty cold. And the only way we can extract energy is if something is really hot, okay? Something that we'll cover in the second half of the lecture, okay? So there's a ton of energy, but we can't pull it out of the ocean, okay? And the, my question for the remaining part of the first half is what tells us how the energy will flow between systems or between parts of a system, what determines if this potential for doing work is realized or not? And before we get to the answer, and we'll spend with the answer, we'll spend the second half of the lecture, okay? But before we get there, I just want to do a little thought experiment and we'll see what your intuitions are, your experience tells you how these things work. So imagine that we have we have two blocks of aluminum or some other metal, but it could be aluminum, which are exactly the same. Okay, they're composed of aluminum, they're the same size. For example, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by five centimeters. Sorry, that doesn't work. 10, 10, five, something like that. Okay, they're exactly the same and they're just sitting on top of each other. Um, now, one of them has a higher temperature, let's say 30 degrees Celsius, and the other one is cold, zero degrees Celsius. Okay, now, what are the internal energies be like? How would they compare? Okay, so we have internal energy one, internal energy two. So those are the respective internal energies of these blocks. Just based on what you know, what is gonna be the, how, how, how will these energies compare? They're the same? Okay, so which, has, which energy will be higher? The U1, okay, can somebody explain why? Yeah, for everybody, if somebody can explain for everybody. It has a potential energy. Oh, okay, so imagine that we're not in gravitational field, okay, we're just somewhere in space, okay, yeah. You're right, there is also a gravitational com uh, component of that. But let's forget about gravitational field, okay? We are in the outer space. Yeah, so the atoms in the top one, because the temperature is higher, okay, will have more kinetic energy. Now, I will not spend another, you know, half an hour, half an hour defining what temperature is and how it relates to kinetic energy. But that's something that you've heard about, okay? Even though the, the details are a little complicated, okay? But sim in a simplified way, the higher the temperature, the higher the average kinetic uh, energy of those particles, okay? So, yeah, we don't really want to deal with temperature. It's complicated. Uh, so, you correctly saying, if the two blocks are exactly the same and we forget about the gravitational field, okay? They are somewhere in the outer space. Um, the upper, the energy of the upper block will be higher, the internal energy, because everything is the same. The only thing that differs is that the particles are moving faster. Okay, good. What will happen? Will energy flow in any way? Okay, so energy will flow from the warmer to the colder one, okay? And it will most likely flow as, we have two different ways of how to transfer energy. 
Airflow as heat, just disordered transfer of energy. Okay, it will not move the the thing up or something like that. Okay, or create electric current or something. Probably not. Anyway, so heat will be transferred. Energy will be transferred as heat between the top one to the bottom one until until they reach some kind of equilibrium and the uh, the temperatures will be the same. Right? That's our intuition. What happens? All right. Why? Okay, the randomness is a way to look at it, okay. Um, we will get to that, okay, what, what that means, this random process. Uh, why, why doesn't the random process move the energy the other way around? Because there is none. There is no excess in comparison relatively. Okay. When it is 30 degrees. Okay, so... Okay, we will talk about that. But your first suggestion is that the reason why energy is moving around, yes, it is, it is done by a random process, I agree. It's, it's transferring heat. But the suggestion was that the heat, the energy, is moving from the top one to the bottom one because there's more energy in the top one, okay? And there's less energy in the bottom one. So the energy wants to equalize, okay? That is not the case. And I will try to show you again intuitively why that is not the case. So imagine that in, um, uh, we're not having any more, we're not having two exactly the same, uh, exactly the same chunks of metal, but actually the bottom chunk is much bigger, okay? It's not 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by five centimeters, but now it is actually one kilometer by one kilometer, whatever. It's huge, okay, huge slab of aluminum. The rest is the same, okay? We have higher temperature, lower temperature, but this slab is massive. In this case, how will the internal energies compare? The one? The bigger one will make a lot smaller and colder. So, uh, well, let's first talk about how the internal energies compare in this case. Which one will be, or are they going to be the same, or is any of them going to be bigger? Okay, in this case, it is U2, so the, the internal energy of the bigger slab of metal, that will be higher. Why? Can you explain that? Yeah. Yeah, not just surface, but more mass, okay? So there are many more particles, and even if the particles on average are moving slower because the temperature is zero, the sum of all the energies is gonna be much, 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 much bigger. Okay? Do we all agree? Yeah. Excellent. How will energy flow? So you're saying that it's gonna be going like this. Okay, so it, this is going to be heating up, and this is going to be getting even colder. So which way is the energy flowing then? Both ways. Yeah, but if the energy is moving both ways, then... Okay, that is still describing just one way flow of energy, okay? So what are you saying is, if this is getting colder and this is getting warmer, the energy is flowing from the top one to the bottom one. What are you describing? Yeah. Yes? Uh, like both energies will like, exchange, so they will like, both be not warm, not cold. Like. Yeah, my question is, in which direction will energy both. flow? Both. In both, both directions. But if it's flowing in both directions, then nothing changes, right? That's fine. So what is the net flow of energy? Zero. From U1 to U2. So some people are saying zero, so nothing will happen. It will just remain like this forever. No. And if it equalizes, which way is the energy flowing? From U1 to U2. So the same thing as before? Oh, so there will be actually zero energy here. Okay, okay. 
So it will be cool to absolute zero. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. Okay, in in interesting. <laughs> okay. This is, imagine that this is in vacuum. There's no surroundings, okay? It's just cool. two bits of metal, okay? Let's not complicate things that maybe, it's, yeah, something is moving away from it, okay? Just make it very simple. So who thinks that energy will flow from, uh, from the top slab, the tiny little thing, 10 by 10 centimeters, to the massive slab? Who thinks that? Just raise your hand. Okay, some people do, okay? Who thinks that energy will actually flow from the bottom one, the massive, massive chunk of metal, to the small one? Okay, some people do. So that will mean that the top one will be getting hotter and hotter. Okay. Why doesn't it make sense? Because if it gets hotter, it's more energy. Yeah, but that's what you say. That's what some people are saying. That energy is moving from the bottom one to the top one. All right. I'll stay the same, all right. So what will actually happen if you do this experiment is that energy will flow exactly the same way as before. It will, from fr it will flow from the top one to the bottom one until the temperatures equalize, okay? So things will occur exactly the same way. It will not, it will not go all the way to absolute zero. <laughs> The energy in this case on U2, so the bottom one, is definitely higher. Because of the, because of the, area is bigger. the mass, so it not the area. So it doesn't, this means that if you don't, like, it doesn't mean that if you have high energy, that's the one that's transferring. Exactly, and that is the reason why I'm showing you this thought experiment. Because the flow of energy is not determined by the amount of energy in those systems. So we can have a system that has a much higher energy, but still, the energy will flow from the system with less energy to the one with more energy. So the amount of energy does not determine which way the, uh, the energy will flow, how it will be transferred, okay? That is not the case. So once again, energy is a potential for doing work, for transferring energy, but a different quantity determines which way will this energy be transferred. And this new quantity that we'll cover in the second part of the lecture is called Entropy. So entropy uh, determines which way the energy Yes, entropy determines everything, why everything and how everything happens in the universe, okay? And we'll cover that in the second part of the lecture, so let's take a four minute break, four minute break and we'll continue with, with entropy. All right, let's now talk about Let's now talk about entropy and how it actually came about. And for that, we will need a little bit of history again. Um, as you all know, in the 18th century, a big revolution occurred in Europe. What revolution? Industrial. Yeah. I thought somebody was going to say French, Revol French Revolution, which there was as well. But we are talking about industri Industrial Revolution. And uh, one of the biggest technologies, or there were two big technologies that, that were part and an important part of the Industrial Revolution, which was the use of fossil fuels, even though they were not in the very beginning of the Industrial, Re industrial Revolution, but they helped them, the revolution to really develop very quickly. And the other one was the steam engine. Okay, the steam engine was actually known since antiquity. It was actually independently discovered or created in China and in ancient Greece, and it was probably a well-known technology uh, and used technology, but mostly it was used for entertainment, okay, all sorts of things that were just moving by themselves. It was really a steam engine, but it was never used for industry. It was only in the 18th century when this technology was actually started to be used for industrial purposes, and there are some historical and socioeconomic reasons for that. However, as it became such an important part of the Industrial Revolution and also of the development of new weapons, uh, many people were starting to f 
were wanted to figure out how to make the best possible steam engine, right? How to make it as efficient as possible. By efficient, I mean by burning as little fuel, getting as much work as possible. Okay, obviously. Okay, you don't want to spend too much coal, and you want to get as much work as possible. And the quest was of scientists and engineers was to figure out how to do that. And there were many suggestions how to do it. For example, using higher pressures or using different gases instead of steam. Okay, some other gas maybe it's going to work better. But none of these suggestions actually was proven to improve the efficiency. One of the people who were studying, who were trying to figure out how to do, how to make a better steam engine, was a French engineer called Sadi Carnot. Sadi Carnot. Do we have anyone from France here? Probably not. Do we? Okay. Anyway. Uh, huh? Okay. Uh, I was just asking if there's somebody from France if you heard of the name Sadi Carnot. No? Okay. All right. Uh, Sadi Carnot. Sadi Carnot came from a very interesting family. His father was a general in Napoleon's army, and he was actually a minister of war under Napoleon, so a very famous, important family. Uh, and interestingly, Sadi Carnot's nephew, I think, then became president of France in the end of the 19th century and was killed in office. There was, he was assassinated in office. So interesting family. Anyway, Sadi Carnot, as a very young, he was first soldier, and then he studied uh, physics and chemistry and mathematics. And he started figuring out how to make a better steam engine. Early 19th century, he published his work in 1824, I think. What he did was he created a theoretical model of how steam engine, how an ideal steam engine should work. Okay? And the model looked like this. You have a, some hot reservoir, okay, fire or something, which is heating things up. This hot reservoir, or from this hot reservoir, some heat is transferred, some energy is transferred as heat to the actual engine. The engine produces some work. And then, and this is quite interesting, then heat is transferred back, not back, but to another reservoir, which is a cold reservoir, so with a lower temperature. Okay, so we have a hot reservoir, high temperature TH, some heat is transferred, the engine does work, and then some heat is transferred to a cold reservoir. Okay? This at the time uh, was based on a completely incorrect theory of what heat actually is. Remember I told you that energy as a concept is very new. It's much, much later than Sadi Carnot. And at that time, what ruled sciences, including physics, was so-called caloric theory. Caloric theory. And caloric theory said that heat is an element Okay, same way as hydrogen or uranium or whatever. Okay, so heat was, it was called caloric. Okay, heat was a type of matter which could not be destroyed. It was conserved. Okay, today we know that's not the case. But Car uh, Carnot based his model on this idea that heat is flowing through the, through the apparatus. It cannot be destroyed, it has to be conserved. Okay, um, and as a model for how heat is flowing, he actually used um, a dam, okay, where we have water in, in gravitational field, and then you just push it through a turbine, which starts turning. Okay, so this was what he had in his, in his head when he developed this model. Based on this model and, and some clever mathematics, he found out that the only thing that determines the efficiency of this kind of engine Nowadays, we call these engines heat engines because they don't have to use steam. We can use other things, okay? So we don't call them steam engines, but heat engines, which is a more general term. He found out that the efficiency of the heat engine only depends 
on the ratio of these two temperatures. Okay, so the efficiency is proportional to TH over TC. In other words, we get perfect 100% efficiency only if TH is infinite or if TC is absolute zero. Then we get 100% efficiency. Now, from later research in thermodynamics, we know that either of these is impossible, okay? We can't get infinite temperature, which sort of makes sense, but we also can't get absolute zero, okay? There are some reasons for that, and if you're more interested in thermodynamics, you can find out why that is impossible, okay? So, it is impossible to make an engine that's 100% efficient, but if you want to make it more efficient, you just make the difference between those two temperatures bigger. Now that on its own was a big advance in figuring out how these things work. It was a, an abstract model that showed something really interesting, okay? So it wasn't really about pressures, it wasn't really about using steam or some other gas, it was really just about the differences of these two temperatures to make a more efficient uh, steam engine, which was very practically useful. However, these findings of Sadi, Sadi Carnot were actually mostly forgotten because he died very young, okay? He, did, he was 35 or something like that when he died of cholera. And since he died of cholera, most of his papers were burned because obviously they were infectious, right? So the findings, although they were published, they were basically forgotten. And it took another couple of decades when people started rediscovering this nice model, even though it was based on a completely wrong theory of what is going on, it was actually very useful mathematically. And one of the most important people who looked at these results and started thinking about them a little bit more and developing them was a German physicist called Rudolf Clausius. And Rudolf Clausius used this model and these, math these mathematics, and he looked at how things work and noticed that in this model, there is a quantity which is conserved. He noticed that when this thing is running as it should be running, okay, so basically cyclically, we're moving heat from, heat from the, the hot reservoir to the cold reservoir and, and work is being produced cyclically. He noticed that a quantity, which is the heat Q1 over TH, actually I'm gonna make it T QH and QC to make it clear what goes with what, okay? So he noticed that this, this heat and this heat divided by temperature is conserved, okay? I'm gonna put it like this, QC, TC, I'll explain a little bit more, okay? Don't worry. It actually comes from this, this expression for efficiency, but I'm not gonna show you that. So basically he noticed in this running machine, there is a quantity which is defined as Q over T. So it is the heat transferred at a temperature and it is conserved. Over the running of that, this, the change in this is zero. And he named this strange quantity, which is Q over T, okay? He named it entropy. Okay, so again, it is, wh what is this, okay? It's the heat transferred at a specific temperature, okay? But he noticed that it has to be conserved, and so he thought, okay, this is probably something really important. Okay? Because in our model of this heat engine, which is a very abstract model, this quantity is conserved. And he called it entropy, and I think it was later on the letter S was assigned to it because most of the other letters were already taken. Okay? So S was remaining there uh, uh, as to be used for entropy. So entropy, or change in entropy, is still defined in this using this thermodynamic approach is defined as the heat transferred divided by the thermodynamic temperature, the absolute temperature at which this transfer occurs, okay? So any system that receives heat 
will increase its entropy by this amount. If it releases heat to the surroundings, energy S heat to the surroundings, its entropy will decrease by this amount. Does that make sense? Yes, so entropy is heat received at a temperature. So if a system receives heat at a specific temperature, it will increase its entropy by this amount, okay? If it releases heat to the surroundings, it will decrease its entropy by this amount. Yep? It is Q over T. That's the definition. No. Um, so it is the entropy of the whole system, okay? Because you are really, you're adding heat here and then you're removing heat here. So basically those two things cancel and you get zero in the end by the, by the cyclical movement of it, okay? Uh, but this is the definition of entropy, okay? So the change in entropy is heat transferred to the, surrounding, uh, to the system divided by the thermodynamic temperature. Now, Based on this, so it sounds like a very abstract thing, okay, Q over T, why, why should that be? But more research into this, both by Clausius and by Lord Kelvin, William Thompson later became Lord Kelvin, from where we have this Kelvin uh, uh, scale of temperature, the absolute temperature, okay? They found out that not only is entropy conserved, remains zero, doesn't change in this specific heat engine, but any process in the universe, which is of a spe very special kind that I'll explain in a second, also conserves its entropy. So this mechanism is actually general, okay? It's not just for heat engines, okay? It is a general thing. Entropy remains the same for processes that we call reversible processes, which is um, in thermodynamics, reversible just means that the system moves in infinitely small steps, and at each step, there is an equilibrium, okay? It doesn't happen, okay? It's a mathematical construct, okay? So most things are not reversible, but they said for any reversible process, delta S is equal to zero, and for any irreversible process, which is everything, delta S is always bigger than zero. So they said that for any process in the universe, well, more specifically, for any process in an isolated system, in a system that does not exchange matter or energy with its surroundings, anything that happens in the system has to at least re uh, keep the entropy at zero or increase it. I mean, change of entropy at zero, okay? We cannot decrease entropy by any process in an isolated system. Since we assume that the universe is an isolated system, it doesn't exchange energy with some other universe or matter, okay? So it's an isolated system. Basically, this says that the entropy of the universe does never, it never decreases, okay? It always goes, really, it always goes up, okay? In theory, if all the processes were reversible, which they aren't, then it could stay the same, but basically, it's, it keeps going up. And this is called the second law of thermodynamics. So we have the first law, which said energy is conserved. It's not created, it's not destroyed. It only moves around or changes from one form to another. The second law says the entropy of an isolated system, such as the universe, has to keep increasing, or at least it must not decrease, okay? But really, it, is, it increases because most processes are not reversible. Okay, so this is the second law of thermodynamics. Can and it, hmm? uh, Which part? <laughs> okay, the second law of thermodynamics, I mean, there are many different formulations of it, but the second law of thermodynamics says that in any isolated system, the entropy must not decrease. Either it can remain the same, but that's for very, very special situations, or it has to increase, okay? This, similar to the conservation of energy, to the first law of thermodynamics, is an empirical law, okay? For the conservation of energy, it is potentially possible that energy might not be conserved, okay? But we haven't really observed that, although 
there are some mathematical reasons, very interesting reasons for the conservation of energy, which, yeah. A very interesting mathematician called Emily Noete, she was German, she was brilliant, and she came up with this theorem which proves why conservation of energy should occur in a universe like ours. So there is some interesting story behind it. However, for the second law of thermodynamics, we don't really have any kind of proof why that should be, okay? It's impossible to show why entropy should be increasing, or maybe it's not impossible, but it hasn't been done yet, okay? So everything that we observe tells us that entropy is increasing. In fact, the fact that we see a direction of time is the reason of the, is the result of the second law of thermodynamics. Because in mechanics, for example, things can go either way, right? If two billiard balls hit each other, we can easily rewind and look at the other way, okay, and it will work the same way. But for example, with spilling milk or putting milk in tea or growing from a child to an adult, if we start looking at it from the op opposite direction, if we turned the arrow of time in the other way, it would be a different world, right? It, we, we can't do that. And this is what's behind it, basically. Entropy of the universe just keep, it keeps increasing, and we can't turn the direction of time and reverse things, okay? So this is a very profound law that really directs a lot of things, especially in biology. Now, this second law of thermodynamics is crucial because it tells us that only those processes that increase the entropy of the universe are possible. Okay? Because we can't decrease entropy. So anything that would decrease the entropy of the universe cannot occur. It would violate the second law of thermodynamics. So anything that happens in, in the universe has to lead to the increase of the entropy of the universe. Now, how do we measure that? Okay? Measuring the entropy of the universe is not an easy thing, as you can imagine, okay? But it would be very useful to be able to measure the changes of entropy of the universe because it would tell us, okay, will this occur, right? Because if we see that entropy of the universe would decrease, then we know that it's not gonna happen, okay? Now, fortunately, physical chemists are a clever bunch, and they figured out another trick how to measure the change of entropy of the universe. And this trick is called Gibbs energy. Change in Gibbs energy is actually telling us the change in entropy of the universe. And I will show you how that works. So, Gibbs energy is actually a derivative, and I will just very briefly show you where, where the idea comes from, because maybe it's gonna be logical, actually comes from a different kind of energy, which is called the Helmholtz energy. And the Helmholtz energy is the internal energy of a system minus the product of temperature times the entropy. And how we can understand this Helmholtz energy is basically by saying, well, if we want to, so Helmholtz energy is really the energy, the part of the energy of a system that we can use to do work. How does it work? Well, we can't use the complete, the total amount of energy to do work because that would actually not increase entropy. And it stems from this idea that we always have to waste some heat. We have to waste some energy not to do work, but just waste it, send it to the surroundings, in order to increase the entropy of the universe, basically. So the Helmholtz energy is just saying, okay, in a system where we have so much energy, we can only use that part of the energy to do work, minus this heat that has to be released outside. Okay, so this really is heat. You can see that Q is equal to T delta S. Right? Good. Gibbs energy is just a cousin, okay, a brother, or whatever, a sister of, uh, of Helmholtz energy, where instead of U, because we said that measuring changes in U is really difficult, we're gonna use enthalpy. So it's basically the same thing, only it's easier for us to measure Gibbs energy changes than Helmholtz energy changes. Does it make sense? So, 
under certain conditions, a change in Gibbs energy is going to be equal to change in enthalpy of the system minus temperature of the system times the change in entropy of the system. Do you agree that we can do this? Okay, we can only do it if the temperature is constant, otherwise this is not gonna work, okay? But let's assume that temperature is constant because otherwise it, it would be much more complicated maths behind it. So we have delta G is equal to delta H, changing the enthalpy of the system, minus T delta S, okay? Now, this is the entropy of the system. So it is clear that we're measuring here entropy of the system. Now, what about this delta H? Delta H is equal to the heat, not change of heat. Heat is a transfer of energy. Not really. Uh, delta H is equal to Q. So it is equal, we saw that before, okay, it was here, yeah? Delta H, change in enthalpy of a system is equal to the heat that the system received that was brought into the system, okay? That was what we said in the beginning, that's the, that's what, okay? Assuming that there's no other work than, than uh, expansion work, but I'm not gonna repeat those things, okay? So delta H is equal to the heat that was received. Now, imagine that we're not interested in the heat that is received, but we're interested in the heat that is given off. This is going to be equal to minus Q. Okay, if the system received two joules of heat, it gave off minus two joules of heat. It's just, we're just playing with the sign and showing the direction in which the heat is going. Does that make sense? If something receives, if something receives two joules, it released minus two joules. No, 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 it's just a sign, okay? So if I give you uh, 10,000 crowns, okay, you gave me minus 10,000 crowns. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, it's just moving the sign which tells you about directions, where it's moving from. It's losing. Yeah, so gaining is a plus sign and losing is a minus sign. Correct, correct. So we're basically, by changing the sign, instead of looking at the system, we start looking at the surroundings. Okay, so if instead of this plus Q, which means receiving heat, we take minus Q, which is releasing heat, then this is going to be, if we put a minus sign instead uh, there, it will mean the heat which is released to the surroundings. Okay, so that's gonna be the minus Q to the surroundings. And minus Q is equal T delta S, minus T delta S, obviously, minus T delta S. But this time, this entropy is not the entropy of the system because we change the perspective. By changing the sign, we change the perspective. This is actually the entropy of the surroundings of the system. So if we go back, we get delta G is equal minus T delta S surroundings minus T delta S system. And if we put it together, just one second, if we put it together, delta G is equal to minus T delta S universe. Because there's nothing else. There's a system and the surroundings and that if we put it together, it's the universe. So a change in Gibbs energy of a system, if we measure it in the system, is telling us with a minus sign is telling us how the entropy of the universe is changing. So by measuring Gibbs energy in, a, in our test tube, it can tell us about the energy, uh, the en or how the process influences the entropy of the universe. Do you understand why you put minus uh, after the Q, in the delta H equal to Q, and then like one hole below? 
Okay, so this minus Q equals minus T delta S is just a reformulation of this thing. Yes. Okay, so there's nothing mysterious about that. So you just call it minus because it is the entropy change of, this, of the surrounding? Pretty much, yes. Okay, okay? because just by changing si uh, the sign, we, we stop looking at the system, we start looking at the surroundings. Okay? The same way as I said, if I give you money, you gave me minus money. Okay. So, by this clever trick, we can say how anything that is happening in our test tube or in our cell or whatever we're measuring, how it is going to change the entropy of the universe. But notice that there's a negative sign. So, as the Gibbs energy of a system goes down, the entropy of the universe goes up. And this is what we want, right? This is what the second law is telling us, okay? So any process, if you do have a question, please ask. Yeah, you? Yeah? Okay, so, sorry. Can you repeat the last question? So since there is a negative sign here, the relationship between Gibbs energy and uh, the entropy of the universe, or change of entropy of the universe, is inverse. So as Gibbs energy goes down, the Gibbs energy of a system goes down, the entropy of the universe goes up. And this is what the second law of thermodynamics is telling us, that those are the correct, that, that's the correct direction, okay? Because the second law says entropy has to keep increasing. Yes? I just had a question. It means that the amount of energy, like, it doesn't change. That's the explanation. Because it's always, they compare to each other to create the, so the fact that energy is not destroyed or is not created, that it, the amount of energy in the universe remains the same, that's the first law of thermodynamics. That's the law of conservation of energy. But here we are basing things on the second law of thermodynamics. We're looking at changes in entropy. There may be some, or there definitely are some moving, movings around of energy. Energy will be transferred and transformed or whatever. But here we're interested in how these processes influence the entropy of the universe. Because only things that will increase it will occur. Things that will decrease the entropy of the universe will not occur. It will be against the second law of thermodynamics. Since uh, Gibbs free energy and uh, entropy of the universe are inversely proportional, does that mean that for, for the system that you're measuring, if they are proportional? N no. So this is the Gibbs energy of the system. And this is the entropy of the universe. So in our system, as we're looking at Gibbs energy and it's going down, yeah. that means that the entropy of the universe is going up. Yeah, yeah. but then for the, when you're observing a closed system, yeah. then it's the opposite when they're directly proportional or not. In an isolated system? Yeah. Um, not really, because then, I mean, there is no surroundings then. So this, this thing basically disappears. We're not releasing, we can't release anything to the surrounding. So we're only gonna be measuring the entropy in the isolated system. Okay, this is really just a way of not having to measure the whole system because the whole system is the universe. Okay, so this is a trick how to get it from measuring what's, what's going on in the, in the test tube. Right, let's have a look at a uh, graphical representation of this thing. So imagine that we have a chemical reaction which starts with reactants A plus B and forms some product C plus D. Okay, doesn't really matter. Some reaction, okay? And I put these double arrow there because it can move in either direction, right? Now, if we draw the relationship of Gibbs energy in the system to the concentration or the ratio of the reactants to the product, so imagine that here we have pure A plus B, here we have pure C plus D, and then as we go along the x-axis, we're, we're getting different ratios of these, yeah? Because the reaction is running through, okay? And we're getting different ratios, yeah? Does it make sense? Okay, good. So generally speaking, the, the change in Gibbs energy or the, the Gibbs energy profile will look something like this. So as we start the reaction with just pure reactants, Gibbs energy will keep decreasing if we started on the other side with pure products, but in this case they are reactants, right? Because we can be moving this way or that way. 
Okay? Again, Gibbs energy would be going down. And since we said that decrease in Gibbs energy is increase of the entropy of the universe, that means that this is the correct direction. Okay? This follows the second law of thermodynamics if the reaction is running this way. In the end, the reaction will get to this point where it will stop because it cannot go uphill. Yeah, so here the change in Gibbs energy is zero and this is the chemical equilibrium. And the reason why the reaction will remain in equilibrium is that it cannot violate the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, so everything runs to the minimum, so this, this would be the minimum Gibbs energy for the system, but since Gibbs energy is related to the um, entropy of the universe in an inverse way, it at the same time is the maximum of the entropy of the universe related to the system, to this process, okay? So this would be the entropy of the universe. No, uh, no, uh, the, the white line is the change in Gibbs energy, is the Gibbs energy, okay? Okay, for when A and B become... Well, for the, for the various different ratios. We start with pure A and B, and then we have a little bit of C and D, and more and more and more and more, and then we are just pure C, C and D, okay? So this is the extent of the reaction, either yes, way. Yes, but there is, there is a ratio that stops. Yeah, this is the equilibrium. The red line is, so this is the relationship between G, Gibbs energy, and the entropy of the universe. So I just showed you how the entropy of the universe changes in this process, okay? And at equilibrium, we get to the maximum entropy, basically. Maximum change in entropy of the universe, okay? And again, since second law of thermodynamics tells us that we can't decrease the entropy of the universe, we can't go uphill against the, the change in Gibbs energy. Again, if we go uphill here, if we try to move from equilibrium this way or that way, we would be decreasing the entropy of the universe. And we can't do that because the second law is telling us we can't do that. So basically everything stays in the equilibrium. That's the end of the reaction, okay? Because we'd be violating the second law. Now, two things to add. First, Remember that I said that Helmholtz energy or Gibbs energy is actually telling us about the amount of work that we can get out of the system, okay? This is the wasted heat, and this is what we can actually use to do work, okay? So imagine that if we start here and we, start, and we end here in the, in the process, in the reaction, we get this delta G, and this is the amount of work that we can really get out of the system. The change in Gibbs energy is telling us how much work, useful transfer of energy we can get out of the system. What you will notice is that the further away we are from the equilibrium, the more work can the system do, okay? If we are at equilibrium, we can't get any work out of that because there's no way to change the Gibbs energy to get any more work out of that, okay? So at equilibrium, the system cannot produce any work. But the, if you move it further and further away from the equilibrium, the more work it can actually do. In fact, for example, in our cells, so th this is true if you do something in a test tube, okay? The reaction starts and then runs to equilibrium, that's it. Most of our metabolism does not work like that, okay? It never actually drops very far away in this, in this ratios of, um, uh, of reactants and products. So we can't really take a delta G, a difference in G, but we take a derivative of G. Okay, those of you who had some calculus know maybe what I'm talking about. So we basically look at the DG at this point because we're not moving away from this point. Our cells are constantly keeping the ratios in the right, in the right ratio, which we need. And this DG also tells us how much work the, um, the system does. Okay, so we, can't, we don't have to drop down here. 
we can just say we are so far from the equilibrium that we can potentially do this much work, which is equal to this derivative of g. The important thing that I want you to remember is that in chemistry and in metabolism, the only thing that determines how much work, how much useful stuff we can get from a reaction is how far it is from the equilibrium. And this is connected to the concept of macroergic compound. Macroergic from Greek, doing a lot of work, okay, big work. Um, Maybe you've heard about some macroergic compounds. What would they be, for example? Examples? Hmm? ATP is a typical example. Acetyl-CoA, phosphoenyl pyruvate, some other ones. We will mention them once we go through them. Okay, so these are called macroergic compounds. What you often find people thinking, or maybe it's even in textbooks, especially some not very sophisticated textbooks, they will tell you that the reason why these compounds like ATP can do some work, some interest, you know, can power something, is that they contain some special bonds that store energy or something like that. That is not true, okay? The real reason why ATP can power things in our cells is that our cells are keeping the system ATP to ADP very far from the equilibrium. That's the only reason. If we had a mixture of ATP to ADP at equilibrium, so we, we had equilibrium mixture of ATP to ADP, we couldn't get any work out of that. Even though the bonds are the same, they are still these macroergic bonds, but they won't do anything because we're at equilibrium. The only thing that makes ATP and phosphoenyl pyruvate and acetyl-CoA, et cetera, macroergic compounds, which can power something, is just the fact that our cells are keeping them very, very far away from equilibrium. So in a test tube, if you'd let it run to equilibrium, it wouldn't be able to do any work? No, of course not. No. Okay? So if you had, like, the, it's from one textbook of bioenergetics, if you had a whole ocean of an equilibrium mixture of ATP to ADP, you couldn't get any work out of it. It's just impossible. It's at equilibrium. Huh? By constantly working, okay? We will talk about the respiratory chain, the electron transport, uh, transport chain in mitochondria, and the whole reason of this, of this metabolic pathway is to make as much ATP so that the, the ratio of ATP to ADP never goes all the way to equilibrium. So our cells are constantly working in order to keep these things away from equilibrium. Yeah, uh, sort of. It is, yeah. So I'll, I will try to kind of answer that because there's, the last thing I want to say is that, and I will, I will get to that. Uh, the second law of thermodynam thermodynamics is, is talking about the entropy of the universe. But the fact that the entropy of the universe has to increase, or at least not decrease, does not mean that locally entropy must not or cannot decrease. In our bodies, our cells are constantly decreasing their own entropy by building proteins, by building nucleic acids, by build, building you know, structures that we need. And this is decreasing our entropy in our cells. But in order to be able to do that, we have to release so much heat to the surroundings that the sum of the changes of entropies is always positive. So we have to, in order to decrease our own entropy, we have to increase the entropy of the universe, of the, of the remaining universe, by a higher amount, so that in total, we are increasing the entropy of the universe. And the implication for that is that for a specific reaction, we can absolutely go in the opposite direction. We can push it up. But in order to do that, we have to connect it to another reaction that is going on the, in the opposite direction. So overall, we have to be decreasing Gibbs energy and increasing the entropy of the universe. But for a specific reaction, we can go up, uphill. But that means that another reaction has to be going downhill and has to be going more downhill than this one is going uphill. So in the example of ATP, basically what our cells are doing, in order to push the ATP-ADP system away from equilibrium, 
they are, for example, burning glucose in a simplified way, okay? They're burning glucose like hell because the entropy which we increase by burning glucose is more than the entropy that we decrease by pushing this thing away from equilibrium, okay? So overall, it has to be bigger than zero, but locally, we can absolutely decrease entropy, and we can go uphill, and this is what our metabolism is constantly doing, okay? So that's why we have to eat so much food and breathe oxygen, because we need to be releasing heat into the surroundings more than we are decreasing the entropy in, in our cells. Okay, questions? I know this is a little bit tricky, and if we wanted to go into like why these things work, we would need a lot of mathematics, and we would probably need like two semesters of thermodynamics. So we don't really have time for that, but hopefully you will get at least some of the chunks of how things work and why they work, okay? And of course, if you're interested in it, it's very easy to find materials for, to, to study the rest of it, okay? There's a question. Wait, 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 wait. Um, not, not really. So the, the Krebs cycle obviously has to follow all these rules. Okay, it has to. So it's based on these thermodynamic rules, but it's not the reason why it has, why it has to go in a circle. Okay. All right. <laughs>